5. A Game of Pool As soon as he opened the door to Ding Yi's brand new three-bedroom apartment, Wang smelled alcohol. Ding was lying on the sofa with the TV on, staring at the ceiling. The apartment was unfinished, with only a few pieces of furniture and little decoration, and the huge living room seemed very empty. The most eye-catching object was the pool table in the corner. Ding didn't seem annoyed by Wang's unannounced visit. He was clearly in the mood to talk to someone. I bought the apartment about three months ago, Bing said. Why did I buy it? Did I really think she was going to become interested in starting a family? His laugh sounded drunk. You too. Wang wanted to know the details of Yang Dong's life, but didn't know how to ask the questions. She was like a star, always so distant. Even the light she shone on me was always cold. Bing walked to one of the windows and looked up at the night sky. Wang said nothing. All he wanted now was to hear her voice. But a year ago, as the sun sank in the west, when she and he had locked eyes for a moment, they had not spoken to each other. He had never heard her voice. Ding waved his hand as though trying to flick something away. Professor Wang, you were right. Don't get involved with the police or the military. They're all idiots. The deaths of those physicists had nothing to do with the frontiers of science. I've explained it to them many times, but I can't get them to understand. They seem to have conducted some independent investigation. Yes, and the investigation scope was global. They should already know that two of the dead never had any contact with the frontiers of science, including Yang Dong. Ding seemed to have trouble saying her name. Ding Yi, you know that I am already involved. So, as far as why Yang made the choice that she did, I'd like to know. I think you must know some of it. One thought he must sound very foolish as he tried hard to disguise his real intent. If you know more, you'll only get pulled in deeper. Right now you're just superficially involved, but with more knowledge your spirit will be drawn in as well and then it will mean real trouble. I work in applied research. I'm not as sensitive as you theoreticians. All right, then. Do you play pool? Ding walked to the pool table. I used to play a little in college. She and I loved to play. It reminded us of particles colliding in the accelerator. Ding picked up two balls, one black and one white. He set the black ball next to one of the pockets and placed the white ball about ten centimeters from the black ball. Can you pocket the black ball? This close? Anyone can do it. Try. Wang picked up the cue, struck the white ball lightly, and drove the black ball into the pocket. Good. Come, now let's move the table to a different location. Ding directed the confused Wang to pick up the heavy table. Together they moved it to another corner of the living room next to a window. Then Ding scooped out the black ball, set it next to the pocket, and again picked up the white ball and set it down about ten centimeters away. Think you can do it again? Of course. Go for it. Again, Wan easily made the shot. Ding waved his hands. Let's move it again. They lifted the table and set it down in a third corner of the living room. Ding set up the two balls as before. Go. Listen, we go. Wan shrugged helplessly. He managed to pocket the black ball a third time. They moved the table two more times, once next to the door of the living room, and finally back to the original location. Ding set up the two balls twice more, and Wan twice more made his shot. By now both were slightly winded. Good, that's the conclusion of the experiment. Let's analyze the results. Ding lit a cigarette before continuing. We ran the same experiment five times. Four of the experiments differed in both location and time. Two of the experiments were at the same location but different times. Aren't you shocked by the results? He opened his arms exaggeratedly. Five times. Every colliding experiment yielded the exact same result. What are you trying to say? One asked, gasping. 
Can you explain this incredible result? Please use the language of physics. All right. During these five experiments, the mass of the two balls never changed. In terms of their locations, as long as we're using the frame of reference of the tabletop, there was also no change. The velocity of the white ball striking the black ball also remained basically the same throughout. Thus, the transfer of momentum between the two balls didn't change. Therefore, in all five experiments, the result was the black ball being driven into the pocket. Ding picked up a bottle of brandy and two dirty glasses from the floor. He filled both and handed one to Wang. Wang declined. Come on, let's celebrate. We've discovered a great principle of nature. The laws of physics are invariant across space and time. All the physical laws of human history, from Archimedes' principle to string theory, and all the scientific discoveries and intellectual fruits of our species are the byproducts of this great law. Compared to us two theoreticians, Einstein and Hawking are mere applied engineers. I still don't understand what you're getting at. Imagine another set of results. The first time, the white ball drove the black ball into the pocket. The second time, the black ball bounced away. The third time, the black ball flew onto the ceiling. The fourth time, the black ball shot around the room like a frightened sparrow, finally taking refuge in your jacket pocket. The fifth time, the black ball flew away at nearly the speed of light, breaking the edge of the pool table, shooting through the wall, and leaving the earth and the solar system, just like Asimov once described. What would you think then? Ding watched Wang. After a long silence, Wang finally said, This actually happened. Am I right? Ding drained both glasses in his hands. He stared at the pool table as though looking at a demon. Yes. It happened. In the last few years, we finally obtained the necessary equipment for experimentally testing fundamental theories. Three expensive pool tables have been constructed, one in North America, another in Europe, and the third you are familiar with, in Liangxiang. Your nanotechnology research center earned a lot of money from it. These high-energy particle accelerators raise the amount of energy available for colliding particles by an order of magnitude, to a level never before achieved by the human race. Yet, with the new equipment, the same particles, the same energy levels, and the same experimental parameters would yield different results. Not only would the results vary if different accelerators were used, but even with the same accelerator, Experiments performed at different times would give different results. Physicists panicked. They repeated the ultra-high energy collision experiments again and again using the same conditions, but every time the result was different, and there seemed to be no pattern. What does this mean? One asked. When he saw Ding staring at him without speaking, he added, Oh, I'm in nanotech, and I also work with microscale structures but that's orders of magnitude larger than the scale at which you do your work. Please educate me. It means that the laws of physics are not invariant across time and space. What does that mean? I think you can deduce the rest. Even General Chang figured it out. He's really a smart man. Wang looked outside the window thoughtfully. The lights of the city were so bright that the stars of the night sky were drowned out. It means that laws of physics that could be applied anywhere in the universe do not exist, which means that physics also does not exist. Wang turned back from the window. I know what I'm doing is irresponsible. But I have no choice, Ding said. That was the second half of her note. You just stumbled on the first half. Now can you understand her? At least a little? Wang picked up the white ball. He caressed it for a bit and put it back down. For someone exploring the forefront of theory, that would indeed be a catastrophe. To accomplish something in theoretical physics requires one to have almost religious faith. It's easy to be led to the abyss. As they said their farewells, Ding gave Wang an address. If you have the time, please visit Yang Dong's mother. She and her mother always lived together 
and she was the entirety of her mother's life. Now the old woman is all alone. Ding, you clearly know a lot more than I do. Can you tell me more? You really believe that the laws of physics are not invariant across time and space. I don't know anything. Ding stared into Wang's eyes for a long time. Finally, he said, but that is the question. Wang knew that he was only finishing what the British colonel had begun to say, to be, or not to be, that is the question. 6. The Shooter and the Farmer The next day was the start of the weekend. Wang got up early and left on his bicycle. As a hobby photographer, his favorite subjects were wildernesses free of human presence. But now that he was middle-aged, he no longer had the energy to engage in such indulgent travel and only shot city scenes. Consciously or subconsciously, he usually chose corners of the city that held some aspect of the wild, a dried lake bed in a park, the freshly turned soil of a construction site, a weed struggling out of cracks in cement. In order to eliminate the busy colors of the city in the background, he only used black and white film. Unexpectedly, he had developed his own style and had gained some notice. His works had been selected for two exhibitions, and he was a member of the Photographer's Association. Every time he went out to take pictures, he would ride his bike and wander around the city in search of inspiration and compositions that caught his fancy. Often he would be out all day. Today, Wang felt strange. His photography style tended toward the classical, calm and dignified. But today he could not seem to get in the mood necessary for such compositions. In his mind, the city, as it awoke from its slumber, seemed to be built on quicksand. The stability was illusory. All night long, he had dreamt of those two billiard balls. They flew around a dark space without any pattern, the black one disappearing against. The black background and only revealing its existence occasionally when it obscured the white ball. Can the fundamental nature of matter really be lawlessness? Can the stability and order of the world be but a temporary dynamic equilibrium achieved in a corner of the universe, a short-lived eddy in a chaotic current? Without realizing it, he found himself at the foot of the newly completed China Central Television building. He stopped at the side of the road and lifted his head to gaze up at this gigantic A-shaped tower, trying to recapture the feeling of stability. His gaze followed the sharp tip of the building gleaming in the morning sunlight, pointing toward the blue, bottomless depths of the sky. Two words suddenly floated into his consciousness, shooter, and farmer. When the members of the frontiers of science discuss physics, they often use the abbreviation, SF. They didn't mean science fiction, but the two words, shooter and farmer. This was a reference to two hypotheses both involving the fundamental nature of the laws of the universe. In the shooter hypothesis, a good marksman shoots at a target, creating a hole every 10 centimeters. Now suppose the surface of the target is inhabited by intelligent, two-dimensional creatures. Their scientists, after observing the universe, discover a great law. There exists a hole in the universe every 10 centimeters. They have mistaken the result of the marksman's momentary whim for an unalterable law of the universe. The farmer hypothesis, on the other hand, has the flavor of a horror story. Every morning on a turkey farm, the farmer comes to feed the turkeys. A scientist turkey, having observed this pattern to hold without change for almost a year, makes the following discovery. Every morning at eleven, food arrives. On the morning of Thanksgiving, the scientist announces this law to the other turkeys. But that morning at eleven, food doesn't arrive. Instead, the farmer comes and kills the entire flock. One felt the road beneath his feet shift like quicksand. The A-shaped building seemed to wobble and sway. He quickly brought his gaze back to the street. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. To get rid of the anxiety, one forced himself to finish a roll of film. He returned home before lunch. His wife had taken their son out and wouldn't be back for a while. Usually, 
Wong would rush to develop the film, but today he wasn't in the mood. After a quick and simple lunch, he went to take a nap. Because he hadn't slept well the night before, by the time he woke up it was almost five. Finally remembering the roll of film he had shot, he went into the cramped darkroom he had converted from a closet. The film developed. Juan began to look through the negatives to see if any shots were worth printing, but he saw something strange in the very first image. The shot was of a small lawn outside a large shopping center. The center of the negative held a line of tiny white marks, which, upon closer examination, turned out to be numbers. 1200 colon zero zero colon zero zero. The second picture also had numbers. 1199 colon 49 colon 33, as did the third. 1199 colon 40 colon 18. In fact, every picture in the roll had such numbers, until the 36th image. 1194 colon 16 colon 37. Wang's first thought was that something was wrong with the film. The camera he had used was a 1988 Leica N2 entirely mechanical, which made it impossible for it to add a date stamp. Given the excellent lens and refined mechanical operation, it was considered a great professional camera even in this digital age. After re-examining the negatives, Wang discovered another strange thing about the numbers. They seemed to adapt to the background. If the background was black, the numbers were white, and vice versa. The shift seemed designed to maximize the number's contrast for visibility. By the time Wang saw the sixteenth negative, his heart was beating faster, and a chill crept up his spine. This shot was of a dead tree against an old wall. The wall was mottled, showing a pattern of alternating black and white patches on the negative. Given this background, either white or black numbers would have been hard to read. But in the picture, the numbers arranged themselves vertically to fit along the curve of the tree trunk, allowing the white numbers to show up against the dark coloring of the dead tree like a crawling snake. Wine began to analyze the mathematical pattern in the numbers. At first he thought it was some kind of assigned numbering, but the difference between the numbers wasn't constant. He then guessed that the numbers represented time in the form of hours, minutes, and seconds. He took out his shooting diary, in which he recorded the exact time he took each picture down to the minute, and discovered the difference between two successive numbers on the photographs corresponded to the difference in time between when they were taken. A Countdown The countdown began with 1,200 hours. And now there were about 1,194 hours left, just under 50 days. Now? No, at the moment I took the last photograph. Is the countdown still proceeding? Wang walked out of the darkroom, loaded a new roll of film in the Leica, and began to snap random shots. He even walked onto the balcony for a few outdoor shots. Afterward, he took out the film and went back into the darkroom. In the developed roll, the numbers again appeared on every negative like ghosts. The first one was marked 1187,27,39. The difference matched the passage of time between the last shot of the last roll and the first shot of this roll. After that, the number decreased by 3 or 4 seconds in each image, 1187, 1187,27,31, 1187,27,31, 1187,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27,27
Just shoot whatever you want. Juan stuffed the camera into her hands and ducked into the dark room. All right. Dodo, why don't I take some pictures of you? His wife aimed the camera at their son. Wang's mind suddenly filled with the imagined sight of the ghost-like figures appearing over his son's face like a hangman's noose. He shuddered. No, don't do that. Shoot something else. The shutter clicked, and his wife had taken her first shot. Why can't I press it again? She asked. Wang taught her how to win the film to advance it. Like that. You have to do it after every shot. Then he ducked back into the dark room. So complicated. His wife, a doctor, couldn't understand why anyone would use such expensive but outdated equipment when 10 or even 20 megapixel digital cameras were common. And he even used black and white film. After the third roll of film developed, one held it up against the red light. He saw that the ghost-like countdown continued. The numbers showed up clearly on every randomly shot picture, including the few he had taken with the lens cap on, 1187, 1187,19,03, 1187,18,59, 1187,18,56. His wife knocked on the darkroom door and told him she was finished with the roll. One opened the door and took the camera from her. As he took out the roll, his hands trembled. Ignoring his wife's concerned look, he took the film back into the dark room and shut the door. He worked fast and clumsily, spilling developer and fixer all over the ground. Soon the images were developed. He closed his eyes, silently praying, Please don't appear. No matter what, please don't appear now. Don't make it my turn. He examined the wet film with a magnifying glass. There was no countdown. The negatives held only the interior shots his wife had taken. She had used a slow shutter speed, and her amateurish operation left all the scenes blurry. But Juan thought these were the most enjoyable pictures he had ever seen. Juan came out of the darkroom and let out a held breath. He was covered in sweat. His wife was in the kitchen cooking and his son was playing in his room. He sat on the sofa and thought the matter over more rationally. First, the numbers, which precisely recorded the passage of time between shots and which showed signs of intelligence, could not possibly have been pre-printed on the film. Something exposed them onto the film. But what? Did the camera have a malfunction? Had some mechanism been installed in the camera without his knowledge? He took off the lens and disassembled the camera. He examined the interior with a magnifying glass and checked every dustless component without discovering anything out of place. Then, considering that the numbers showed up even in the shots. Taken with the lens cap on, he realized the most likely light source was some kind of penetrating ray. But how was this technologically possible? Where was the source of the rays? How could they have been aimed? At least given current technology, such power would be supernatural. In order to see if the ghostly countdown had disappeared, one loaded another roll into the Leica, and again began to shoot randomly. When this roll was developed, Wang's short-lived calm was again shattered. He felt himself pushed to the precipice of madness. The countdown had returned. Based on the numbers, it had never stopped just failed to display on the roll shot by his wife. 1186 colon 34 colon 13, 1186 colon 34 colon 02, 1186 colon 33 colon 46, 1186 colon 33 colon 35. Wang rushed out of the darkroom and continued through the door of the apartment. He knocked loudly on the door of his neighbor, retired Professor Zhang. Professor Zhang, do you have a camera? Not a digital one, but one that takes film. A professional photographer like you wants to borrow my camera? What happened to your expensive one? I have only digital point and shoots. Are you okay? Your face looks so pale. Please let me borrow it. Zhang returned with a common Kodak digital camera. Here you go. 
You can just delete the few pictures already on there. Thank you. Wang seized the camera and rushed back home. He actually had three more film cameras and a digital one, but Wan thought it better to borrow a camera from someone else. He looked at his own camera lying on the sofa and a few rolls of film, paused in thought, and decided to reload the Leica with new film. He handed the borrowed digital camera to his wife, who was setting out dinner. Quick! Shoot another few pictures like before. What are you doing? Look at your face. What's happening? Don't worry about it. Shoot. She put down the dishes and came over to him, her eyes filled with both worry and fright. Juan stuffed the Kodak into the hands of his six-year-old son, who was about to start eating dinner. Dodo, come help daddy. Push this button. Right, like that. That's one shot. Push it again. That's another shot. Keep on shooting like that. You can take pictures of anything you want. The boy learned quickly. He was very interested and made rapid shots. Wang turned around and picked up the Leica from the couch and began to shoot as well. The father and son kept on pressing the shutters as though they were mad. His wife, not knowing what to do as the flashes went off around her, began to cry. Wang Miao, I know that you've been under a lot of pressure lately. But please, I hope you haven't. Wan finished the roll in the Leica and grabbed the digital from his son. He thought for a moment, and then, in order to avoid his wife, went into the bedroom and took a few more shots with the digital. He used the optical finder instead of the LCD because he was afraid to see the results, though he was going to have to face them soon enough. Wan took out the film from the Leica and went back into the darkroom. He shut the door and worked. After the film was developed, he examined the images carefully. Because his hands were shaking, he had to hold the magnifying glass with both hands. On the negatives, the countdown continued. Wang rushed out of the darkroom and began to look through the digital images on the Kodak. On the LCD, he saw that the pictures his son had taken did not have the numbers, but in the pictures that he took, the countdown showed clearly and was synchronized with the numbers on the film. By using different cameras, Wang was trying to eliminate problems with the camera or the film as possible explanations. But by allowing his son and his wife to take some pictures, he discovered an even stranger result. The countdown only appeared on the pictures he took. Desperate, Wang picked up the pile of film rolls, like a tangled nest of snakes, like a bunch of ropes tied into an impossible knot. He knew that he could not solve the mystery on his own. Who could he turn to? His old classmates from college and his colleagues at the research center were hopeless. Like him, they were all people with technical minds. Intuitively, he knew that this went beyond a technical problem. He thought of Dingy, but that man was now in a spiritual crisis of his own. Finally, he thought of the frontiers of science. These were deep thinkers who remained open-minded. So he dialed Shen Yufei's number. Dr. Shen, I have a problem. I must see you. Come over, Shen said and hung up. Wang was surprised. Shen was a woman of few words. Some in the frontiers of science jokingly called her the female Hemingway. But the fact that she didn't even ask him what was wrong made Wang uncertain whether he should be comforted or even more anxious. He stuffed the mess of film into a bag, and taking the digital camera, rushed out of the apartment as his wife watched him anxiously. He could have driven, but even with the city being full of lights, he wanted to be with people. He called for a cab. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Shin lived in a luxury housing development reachable by one of the newer commuter rails. Here, the lights were much dimmer. The houses were set around a small artificial lake stocked with fish for the residents, and at night the place felt like a village. Shin was clearly well off, but Wan could never figure out the source of her wealth. Neither her old research position nor her current job with a private company could earn that much income, but her house didn't show signs of luxury on the inside. 
It was used as a gathering place for the frontiers of science, and one always thought it resembled a small library with a meeting room. In the living room, one saw Wei Ching, Xin's husband. Wei was about forty years old and had the look of a staid, honest intellectual. One knew little about him other than his name. Shin hadn't said much when she introduced him. He didn't seem to have a job, since he stayed home all day. He never showed any interest in the frontiers of science discussions, but seemed used to the sight of so many scholars coming to their house. But he wasn't idle. He appeared to be conducting some kind of research at home, always deep in thought. Whenever he met any visitor, he would greet them absent-mindedly and then return to his room upstairs. Most of his day was spent there. One time, Wang glanced into his room through the half-open door and saw an astonishing sight, a powerful HP workstation. He was sure of what he saw because the workstation was the same model as the one he used at the research center, slate gray chassis, model RX-8620, four years old. It seemed very strange to own a machine costing more than a million yuan just for personal use. What was Wei Ching doing with it all day? Yu Fei is a bit busy right now. Why don't you wait a while? Wei Ching walked upstairs. Wan tried to wait, but he found that he couldn't be still, so he followed Wei Ching. Wei was about to enter his room with the workstation when he saw Wang behind him, but he didn't seem annoyed. He pointed to the room across from his. She's in there. Wan knocked on the door. It wasn't locked, and it opened a crack. Shin was seated in front of a computer, playing a game. He was surprised to see that she wore a V-suit. The V-suit was a very popular piece of equipment among gamers, made up of a panoramic viewing helmet and a haptic feedback suit. The suit allowed the player to experience the sensations of the game, being struck by a fist, being stabbed by a knife, being burned by flames, and so on. It was also capable of generating feelings of extreme heat and cold, even simulating the sensation of being exposed in a snowstorm. Wang walked behind her. As the game was displayed only on the inside of the panoramic viewing helmet, there were no colorful images on the computer monitor. Wang suddenly remembered Sher Chang's comment about memorizing web and email addresses. He glanced at the monitor. The game site's URL caught his attention. She took off the helmet and stripped off the haptic feedback suit. She put on her glasses, which appeared extra large against her thin face. Without any expression, she nodded at Wang and said nothing. Wang took out the mess of film rolls and began to explain his strange experience. Shin paid full attention to his story, picking up the rolls of film and only casually looking at them. This surprised Wang but further confirmed for him that Shin wasn't completely ignorant about what he was going through. He almost stopped speaking, but Shin kept on nodding at him, indicating that he should continue. When he finished, Shin spoke for the first time. How's the nanomaterial project you're leading proceeding? This non-sequitur disoriented Wang. The nanomaterial project? What does that have to do with this? He pointed at the rolls of film. Shin didn't answer but continued to stare at him, waiting for him to answer her question. This was always her style, never wasting a single word. Stop your research, she said. What? Wang wasn't sure he heard right. What are you talking about? Shin remained silent. Stop? That's a key national project. Shin still said nothing, only looking at him calmly. You have to give me a reason. Just stop. Try it. What do you know? Tell me. I've told you all I can. I can't stop the project. It's impossible. Just stop. Try it. That was the end of the conversation about the countdown. After that, no matter how hard one tried, Shin only repeated. Just stop. Try it. I understand now. Wang said. The frontiers of science isn't just a discussion group about fundamental theory, like you claimed. Its connection to reality is far more complicated than I had imagined. No. It's the opposite. 
Your impression is due to the fact that the frontiers of science concerns matters far more fundamental than you imagine. Desperate, Juan got up to leave without saying goodbye. Mutely, Shin accompanied him to the door and watched as he got into the taxi. Just then, another car drove up and braked to a hard stop in front of the door. A man got out. By the faint light leaking from the house, Wang recognized him immediately. The man was Pan Han, one of the most prominent members of the frontiers of science. A biologist, he had successfully predicted the birth defects associated with long-term consumption of genetically modified foods. He had also predicted the ecological disasters that would come with cultivation of genetically modified crops. Unlike the prophets of doom who regularly warn of catastrophes without any particulars, Pan made. Predictions that always gave many specific details that later turned out to be correct. His accuracy was such that there were rumors that he came from the future. The other cause for his fame was that he had created China's first experimental community. Unlike the return to nature, utopian groups in the West, his pastoral China, wasn't located in the wilderness, but in the midst of one of its largest cities. The community had no property of its own. Everything needed for daily life, including food, came from urban trash. Contrary to the predictions of many, pastoral China not only survived, but thrived. Currently, it had more than 3,000 permanent members, and countless others had joined for short stints to experience the lifestyle. Based on these two successes, Pan's opinions on social issues had grown more and more influential. He believed that technological progress was a disease in human society. The explosive development of technology was analogous to the growth of cancer cells, and the results would be identical. The exhaustion of all sources of nourishment, the destruction of organs, and the final death of the host body. He advocated abolishing crude technologies such as fossil fuels and nuclear energy, and keeping gentler technologies such as solar power and small-scale hydroelectric power. He believed in the gradual de-urbanization of modern metropolises by distributing the population more evenly in self-sufficient small towns and villages. Relying on the gentler technologies, he would build a new agricultural society. Is he in? Pan asked Shin pointing to the house. Shin didn't answer, but blocked his progress. I have to warn him and also warn you. Do not force our hand. Pan's voice was cold. Shin called to the taxi driver. You can go now. After the taxi started, Wan couldn't hear any more of the conversation between Shin and Pan, but he glanced back and saw that Shin did not let Pan into the house. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. By the time Wang arrived home, it was already after midnight. As Wang got out of the taxi, a black Volkswagen Santana braked to a stop next to him. The window rolled down and a cloud of smoke emerged. Sher Chang's thick body filled the driver's seat. Professor Wang! Academician Wang! How have you been the last couple of days? Are you following me? Don't you have anything better to do? Now, don't misunderstand me. I could have just driven past you, but instead, I chose to be polite and stop to greet you. You're making being nice a thankless task. Sure revealed his trademark roguish smirk. Well? Did you find out any useful information over there? I've told you already. I don't want anything to do with you. Please leave me alone from now on. Fine. Sure started the car. It's not like I'm going to starve without the overtime for doing this. I'd rather not have missed my soccer match. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Wang entered the apartment. His wife was already asleep. He could hear her tossing and turning in bed, mumbling anxiously. Her husband's strange behavior during the day was surely giving her bad dreams. Wang swallowed a few sleeping pills, lay down on the bed, and after a long wait, fell asleep. His dreams were chaotic, but there was one constant, the ghostly countdown, suspended in midair. Even before he fell asleep, he had known he would dream of it. In his dreams, he attacked the countdown. 
Crazed, he tore at it, bit it, but every attempt failed to leave a mark. It continued to hang in the middle of his dream, steadily ticking away. Finally, just as the frustration became almost intolerable, he woke up. Opening his eyes, he saw the ceiling, indistinct above him. The city lights outside the window cast a dim glow against it through the curtains. But one thing did follow him from dream into reality, the countdown. It was still hovering before his eyes. The numbers were thin, but very bright with a burning, white glow. 1180 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 he was now certain that he was awake, but the countdown did not disappear. He shut his eyes, and the countdown remained in the darkness of his vision, looking like mercury flowing against a black swan's feathers. He opened his eyes, rubbed them, and still the countdown did not go away. No matter how he moved his gaze, the numbers stayed at the center of it. A nameless terror made Wang sit up. The countdown clung to him. He jumped off the bed, tore the curtains apart, and pushed the window open. The city, deep in sleep, was still brightly lit the countdown hovered before this grand background like subtitles on a movie screen. Wang felt he was suffocating. He let out a stifled scream. His wife, frightened awake, questioned him anxiously. He tried to force himself to be calm and comforted her, telling her that it was nothing. He lay back on the bed, closed his eyes, and spent the rest of his difficult night under the constant glow of the countdown. In the morning, he tried to act normal in front of his family, but he could not fool his wife. She asked him whether his eyes were all right, whether he could see clearly. After breakfast, Wang called the research center and asked for the day off. He drove to the hospital. Along the way, the countdown mercilessly hovered in front of the real world. It was able to adjust its brightness so that, no matter what the background, it showed up distinctly. Wan even tried to temporarily overwhelm the display by staring into the rising sun. But it was useless. The infernal numbers turned black and showed up against the orb of the sun like projected shadows, which made them even more frightening. Tongren Hospital was very busy but Wang was able to see a famous ophthalmologist who had gone to school with his wife. He asked the doctor to test him, without describing the symptoms. After careful examination of both eyes, the doctor told him they were functioning normally with no signs of any disease. There's something stuck in my vision. No matter where I look, it's always there. As Wang said this, the numbers hovered in front of the doctor's face. 1175 11,33, Oh, you're talking about floaters. The doctor took out a prescription pad and began to write. They're common at our age, the result of clouding in the lens. They're not easy to cure, but they're also not a big deal. I'll give you some iodine drops and vitamin D. It's possible that they'll go away, but don't get your hopes up too much. Really, they're nothing to worry about, as they don't affect your vision. You just have to get used to ignoring them. Floaters. Can you tell me what they look like? There's no real pattern. It differs by person. For some, they appear as tiny black dots. For others, like tadpoles. What if someone sees a series of numbers? The doctor's pen stopped. You see numbers? Yes, right in the middle of the visual field. The doctor pushed his pen and paper away and looked at him sympathetically. As soon as you came in, I could tell you'd been working too much. At the last class reunion, Liao told me you were under a lot of pressure at work. We have to be careful at our age. Our health is no longer what it used to be. You are saying this is due to psychological factors? The doctor nodded. If it was anyone else, I'd suggest you go see a psychiatrist. But it's nothing serious, just exhaustion. 
Why don't you rest for a few days? Take a vacation. Go be with Yao and your kid what's his name? Dodo, right? No worries. They'll go away soon. 1175 colon 10 colon 02 1175 colon 10 colon 01 1175 colon 10 colon 00 1175 colon 09 colon 59 Let me tell you what I see. It's a countdown. One second after another, it keeps on ticking precisely. Are you saying this is all in my head? The doctor gave him a tolerant smile. You know how much the mind can affect vision. Last month we had a patient a girl, maybe 15, 16. She was in class when she suddenly lost the ability to see, went completely blind. But all the tests showed that there was nothing wrong with her eyes physiologically. Finally, someone from the Department of Psychiatry treated her with psychotherapy for a month. All of a sudden, her vision returned. Juan knew that he was wasting his time here. He got up. All right, let's not talk about my eyes anymore. I have one last question. Do you know of any physical phenomenon that can operate from a distance and make people see visions? The doctor gave this some thought. Yes, I do. A while ago I was part of the medical team for the Shenzhou-19 spacecraft. Some taikonauts engaged in extravehicular activities reported seeing flashes that didn't exist. The astronauts on the International Space Station reported similar experiences. It was because during periods of intense solar activity, high-energy particles struck against the retina, causing them to see flashes. But you're talking about numbers A countdown, even. Solar activity can't possibly cause that. Wang walked out of the hospital in a daze. The countdown continued to hover in his eyes, and he seemed to be following the numbers, following a ghost that would not leave him. He bought a pair of sunglasses and put them on so that others would not see his eyes wandering around as though he were sleepwalking. Before entering the main lab at the Nanotechnology Research Center, Wang took off his sunglasses. Even so, his colleagues noticed his apparent mental state and gave him concerned looks. Wang saw that the main reaction chamber in the middle of the lab was still in operation. The main compartment of the gigantic apparatus was a sphere with many pipes connected to it. They had made small quantities of a new, ultra-strong nanomaterial that they'd given the code name, Flying Blade. But the samples so far were all made with molecular construction techniques that is, using a nanoscale molecular probe to stack the molecules one by one, like laying out bricks for a wall. This method was very resource-intensive, and the results might as well have been the world's most precious jewels. It was impractical to produce large quantities this way. At the moment, the lab was attempting to develop a catalytic reaction as a substitute for molecular construction so that large numbers of molecules would stack themselves into the right arrangement. The main reaction chamber could rapidly run through a large number of reactions using different molecular combinations. There were so many combinations that normal manual testing methods would have taken more than a hundred years. In addition, the apparatus augmented actual reactions with mathematical simulations. When the reaction reached a certain stage, the computer would build a mathematical model of it based on intermediate products and finish the remainder of the reaction via simulation. This greatly boosted the experimental efficiency. When the lab director saw Wang, he hurried over and began to report a series of malfunctions with the main reaction chamber a recent ritual whenever Wang arrived at work. By now the main reaction chamber had been in continuous operation for more than a year, and many sensors had lost sensitivity resulting in measurement errors that required shutting down the apparatus for maintenance. But as the lead scientist on the project, Wang insisted that the machine would not be shut down until the third set of molecular combinations was finished. The technicians had no choice but to jury-rig more and more kludges onto the main reaction chamber to compensate. And now those kludges required their own kludges, a state of affairs that exhausted the project staff but the lab director carefully avoided the topic of shutting down the machine and temporarily halting the experiment, 
as he knew that such discussions tended to enrage Wang Miao. He just laid out the difficulties before Wang, though his unspoken desire was clear. Engineers rushed around the main reaction chamber like doctors around a critical patient, trying to keep it going for a little longer. In front of the whole scene, the countdown appeared. 1174 colon 21 colon 11, 1174 colon 21 colon 10, 1174 colon 21 colon 09, 1174 colon 21 colon 08. Just stop. Try it. Shin's words came to Wang. How long would it take to completely overhaul the sensors? Wang asked. Four or five days. Now that the lab director saw a ray of hope, he quickly added. If we work fast, it will take only three days. I guarantee it, Chief Wang. I'm not giving in, Wang thought. The equipment really needs maintenance, so the experiment must be temporarily stopped. This has nothing to do with anything else. He turned to the lab director and focused on him through the hovering countdown. Shut down the experiment and perform the maintenance. Follow the schedule you gave me. Absolutely, Chief Wang. I'll give you an updated schedule right away. We can stop the reaction this afternoon. You can stop it right now. The lab director stared at him in disbelief, but soon he was excited again, as if afraid to lose this opportunity. He picked up the phone and issued the order to stop the reaction. All the exhausted researchers and technicians grew excited, too. They immediately began the procedures to shut down the main reaction chamber, flipping a hundred complex switches. The various control screens became dark one after another, until finally, the main screen reflected the main reaction chamber's halted status. Almost simultaneously, the countdown before Wang's eyes also stopped. The final number was 1174-10-07. A few seconds later, the numbers flickered and disappeared. As the world re-emerged, free of the ghostly numbers, Wang let out a long breath, as though he had just struggled up from underwater. He sat down, drained, and realized that others were still watching him. He turned to the lab director. System maintenance is the responsibility of the equipment division. Why don't all of you in the research group take a break for a few days? I know everyone's been working hard. Chief Wang, you're tired too. Chief Engineer Zhang can take care of things here. Why don't you go home and rest as well? Yes, I am tired, Wang said. After the lab director left, he picked up the phone and dialed Xin Yufei's number. She picked up after one ring. Who or what is behind this? Wang asked. He tried to make his voice calm, but failed. Silence. What will happen at the end of the countdown? More silence. Are you listening? Yes. Why nanomaterials? This is not a particle accelerator. It's just applied research. Is it worth your attention? Whether something is worth the attention is not for us to decide. That's enough. Wan shouted into the phone. The terror and desperation of the last few days suddenly turned into uncontrollable rage. Do you think these cheap tricks can fool me? Can stop technological progress? I admit that I can't, for now, explain how you're doing it. But that's only because I haven't been able to peek behind the curtain of your shameful illusionist. You're saying you want to see the countdown on an even greater scale? Shin's question stunned Wang for a moment. He forced himself to be calm so he wouldn't fall into a trap. Put away your set of tricks. So what if? You show it at a bigger scale? It's still only an illusion. You can project a hologram into the sky, like what NATO did during the last war. With a powerful enough laser you can project an image onto the surface of the moon. The shooter and the farmer should be able to manipulate matters at a scale that humans cannot. For example, can you make the countdown appear on the surface of the sun? Wang's mouth hung open. He had shocked himself with his own words. Unconsciously, he had named the two hypotheses that he ought to have avoided. He felt on the verge of falling into the same mental trap that had claimed the other victims. 
trying to seize the initiative, he continued. I can't anticipate all your tricks, but even with the sun, perhaps your despicable illusionist can still somehow make the deception seem real. To give a demonstration that will really be convincing, you have to display it at an even larger scale. The question is whether you can take it. Chen said, We're friends. I want to help you avoid Yang Dong's fate. The mention of Yang's name made Wang shudder, but another surge of anger made him reckless. Will you take up my challenge? Of course. What are you going to do? Do you have a computer connected to the internet? Okay, enter the following web address. You got it open. Now print it out and keep it with you. Wang saw that the page was nothing more than a Morse code chart. I don't understand. This, during the next two days, please find a place where you can observe the cosmic microwave background. For specifics, please check the email I'll send you. What? Are you going to do? I know that your nanomaterial project has been stopped. Do you plan on restarting it? Of course. Three days from now. Then the countdown will continue. At what scale will I see it? A long silence followed. This woman, who was acting as the spokesperson for some force beyond human understanding, blocked every exit Wang had. Three days from now, that's the 14th between 1 and 5 in the morning, the entire universe will flicker for you. 7. Three Body, King Wen of Zhou and the Long Night. Wang dialed Ding Yi's number. Only when Ding picked up did he realize that it was already one in the morning. This is Wang Miao. I'm sorry to be calling so late. No problem. I can't sleep anyway. I have seen something, and I'd like your help. Do you know if there are any facilities in China that are observing the cosmic microwave background? Wang had the urge to talk to someone about what was going on but he thought it best to not let too many people know about the countdown that only he could see. The cosmic microwave background? What made you interested in that? I guess you really have run into some problems. Have you been to see Yang Dong's mother yet? I'm sorry. I forgot. No worries. Right now, many scientists have seen something like you. Everyone's distracted but I think it's still best if you go visit her. She's getting on in years, and she won't hire a caretaker. If there's some task around the home that she needs help with, please help her. Oh, right, the cosmic microwave background. You can ask Yang's mother. Before she retired, she was an astrophysicist. She's very familiar with such facilities in China. Good. I'll go after work today. Then I'll thank you in advance. I really can't face anything that reminds me of Yang Dong again. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. After hanging up, Wang sat in front of his computer and printed out the simple Morse code chart. By now, he was calm enough to turn his thoughts away from the countdown. He pondered the frontiers of science, Xin Yufei, and the computer game she had been playing. The only thing he knew for certain about Chen was that she wasn't the type to enjoy computer games. She spoke like a telegraph and gave him the impression that she was always extremely cold. It wasn't the kind of coldness that some people put on like a mask hers suffused her all the way through. Wang subconsciously thought of her as the long obsolete DOS operating system. A blank, black screen, a bear. See backslash. Prompt, a blinking cursor. Whatever you entered, it echoed back. Not one extra letter and not a single change. But now he knew that behind the C backslash was a bottomless abyss. She's actually interested in a game? A game that requires a V-suit? She has no kids, which means she bought the V-suit for herself. The very idea is preposterous. Wang entered the address for the game into the browser. It had been easy to memorize. The site indicated that the game only supported access via V-suit. Wang remembered that the employee lounge at the Nanotechnology Research Center had a V-suit. He left the now-empty main lab and went to the security office to get the key. 
In the lounge, he passed the pool tables and the exercise machines and found the V-suit next to a computer. He struggled into the haptic feedback suit, put on the panoramic viewing helmet, and turned on the computer. After entering the game, Wang found himself in the middle of a desolate plain at dawn. The plain was dun-colored blurry, its details hard to make out. In the distance, there was a sliver of white light on the horizon. Twinkling stars covered the rest of the sky. There was a loud explosion, and two red glowing mountains crashed against the earth in the distance. The whole plain was bathed in red light. When the dust finally cleared from the sky, one saw two giant words erected between the sky and the earth. Next came a registration screen. Wang created the ID, hired, and logged in. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. The plane remained desolate, but now the compressors in the V-suit whirred to life, and Wang could feel gusts of cold air against his body. Before him appeared two walking figures, forming dark silhouettes against the dawn light. Wang ran after them. He saw that both figures were male. They were dressed in long robes full of holes, covered by dirty animal hides. Each carried a short, wide bronze sword. One of them carried a narrow wooden trunk that was as long as half his height. He turned around to look at Wang. The man's face was as dirty and wrinkled as the hide he wore, but his eyes were sharp and lively, the pupils glinting in the early morning glow. It's cold, he said. Yes, very cold. This is the Warring States period, the man with the trunk on his back said. I am King Wen of Zhou. I don't think King Wen belongs to the Warring States period, Wang said. He survived until now, the other man said. King Zhou of Shang is alive, too. I am a follower of King Wen. Indeed, that's my login ID, follower of King Wen of Zhou. He's a genius, you know? My login ID is Hiren. What are you carrying on your back? King Wen put down the rectangular trunk and stood it up vertically. He opened one of the sides like a door and revealed five compartments within. By the faint light, one could see that every layer held a small mound of sand. Every compartment seemed to have sand falling into it from the compartment above, through a small hole. A type of sand glass. Every eight hours all the sand flows to the bottom. Flip it three times and you can measure a day. But often I forget to flip it, and I need follower here to remind me. You seem to be on a very long journey. Is it necessary to carry such a bulky clock? How else would we measure time? A portable sundial would be much more convenient. Or else you could just look at the sun and know the approximate time. King Wen and Follower stared at each other, and then turned as one to gaze at Wang, as though he was an idiot. The sun? How can the sun tell us the time? We're in the midst of a chaotic era. Wang was about to ask for the meaning of the strange term when Follower cried out piteously. It's so cold. I'm going to die of the cold. Wang felt very cold as well. But in most games, taking off his V-suit would immediately cause his ID to be deleted by the system. He couldn't do that, he said. When the sun comes out it will be warmer. Are you pretending to be some kind of oracle? Even King Wen cannot predict the future. Followers shook his head contemptuously. What does what I said have to do with predicting the future? Everyone can see that the sun will rise in about another hour or two. Wang pointed to the sliver of light above the horizon. This is a chaotic era. What is a chaotic era? Other than stable eras, all times are chaotic eras. King Wen answered the way he would have spoken to an ignorant child. Indeed, the light over the horizon dimmed and soon disappeared. Night covered everything. The stars overhead shone even more brightly. So that was dusk instead of dawn? Wan asked. It is morning. But the sun doesn't always rise in the morning. That's what a chaotic era is like. Wan found the cold hard to take. It looks like the sun won't rise for a long time. He shivered and pointed to the blurry horizon. What makes you think that? There's no way to be certain. 
I told you, this is a chaotic era. Follower turned to King Wen. May I have some dried fish? Absolutely not. King Wen's tone brooked no disagreement. I barely have enough for myself. We must guarantee that I make it to Zhao Ge, not you. As they spoke, Wan noticed the sky brightening over another part of the horizon. He couldn't be sure of the compass directions, but he was sure the direction this time was different from last time. The sky grew brighter, and soon, the sun of this world rose. It was small and bluish in color, like a very bright moon. Wan still felt a bit of warmth, and could now see the landscape around him more clearly. But the day didn't last long. The sun traversed a shallow arc over the horizon and soon set. Night and the bone-shilling cold once more settled over everything. The three travelers stopped in front of a dead tree. King Wen and Follower took out their bronze swords to chop the tree into firewood, and one gathered the firewood into a pile. Follower took out a piece of flint and struck it against the blade until the sparks caught. The fire soon warmed the front of Wang's v-suit, but his back remained cold. We should burn some of the dehydrated bodies, Follower said. Then we'll have a roaring fire. Put that thought out of your mind. Only the tyrant King Zhou would engage in that kind of behavior. We've seen so many dehydrated bodies scattered along the road here. They've been torn, and won't be revivable even when rehydrated. If your theory really works, what does it matter if we burn a few of them? We can even eat some. How can a few lives compare to the importance of your theory? Stop with that nonsense. We're scholars. After the fire burned out, the three continued their journey. Since they were not speaking to each other much, the system sped up the passage of in-game time. King Wen flipped the sand glass on his back six times rapidly, indicating the lapse of two days. The sun never rose once, not even a hint of dawn over the horizon. It seems that the sun will never rise again, Wang said. He brought up the game menu to take a look at his health bar. Due to the extreme cold, it was steadily decreasing. Again, you're pretending you're some kind of oracle, Follower said. But this time he and Wang finished the thought together. This is a chaotic era. Soon after this, however, dawn did appear over the horizon. The sky brightened rapidly, and the sun rose. One noticed that this time, the sun was gigantic. After just half of it rose, it took up at least one-fifth of the visible horizon. Waves of heat bathed them, and Wang felt refreshed. But when he glanced over at King Wen and Follower, he saw that both had terror on their faces as though they had seen a demon. Quick! Find shade! Follower shouted. Wang ran after them. They ducked behind a large rock. The shadow cast by the rock gradually grew shorter and shorter. The earth around them glowed as though on fire. The permafrost beneath them soon melted, the steel-like hard surface turning into a sea of mud, roiled by waves of heat. Wang sweated profusely. When the sun was directly overhead, the three covered their heads with the animal hides, but the bright light still shot through the holes and gaps like arrows. The three shifted around the rock until they were able to hide inside the new shadow that had just appeared on the other side. After the sun set, the air remained hot and damp. The three sweat-drenched travelers sat on the rock. Followers spoke with dismay. Traveling during a chaotic era is like walking through hell. I can't stand it anymore. Also, I haven't had anything to eat because you won't give me any dried fish and you won't let me eat the dehydrated bodies. What, the only choice is to dehydrate you? King Wen said, fanning himself with a piece of hide. You won't abandon me afterwards, will you? Of course not. I promise to bring you to Zhao Ge. Followers stripped off his sweat-soaked robe and lay down nude on the muddy earth. In the last glow from the sun, already below the horizon, Wang saw water oozing out of Follower's body. He knew that it was no longer sweat. All the water in his body was being discharged and squeezed out. The water coalesced into a few small rivulets in the mud. 
His body turned soft and lost its shape like a melting candle. Ten minutes later, all the water had been eliminated from his body. Follower was now a man-shaped piece of leather stretched out on the ground. His facial features had flattened and become indistinct. Is he dead? Wang asked. He remembered seeing such man-shaped pieces of hide scattered along the road. Some were torn and incomplete. He supposed they were the dehydrated bodies Follower spoke of earlier as potential kindling. No, King Wen answered. He picked up Follower's skin, brushed the mud and dust off, laid him out on the rock, and rolled him up like a balloon with its air let out. He'll recover soon enough when we soak him in water. It's just like soaking dried mushrooms. Even his bones have turned soft. Yes. His skeleton has turned into dried fibers. This makes him easy to carry. In this world, can everyone be dehydrated and rehydrated? Of course. You can, too. Otherwise, we could not survive the chaotic eras. King Wen handed the rolled-up follower to Wang. Carry him. If you abandon him on the road, he'll be burned or eaten. Wang accepted the skin, a light roll. He held it under his arm and it didn't feel too strange. With Wan carrying the dehydrated follower and King when carrying the sand glass, the two continued their arduous journey. Like the previous few days, the progress of the sun in this world followed no pattern. After a long, frigid night lasting several days' worth of time, a brief but scorching day might follow, and vice versa. The two relied on each other for survival. They lit fires to hold off the cold, and ducked into lakes to avoid the heat. At least the game sped up the progress of time. A month in game time might pass in half an hour. This made the journey through the chaotic era at least tolerable for Wang. One day, after a long night that lasted almost a week, King Wen suddenly shouted joyously as he pointed to the night sky. Flying stars! Two flying stars! Actually, Wan had already noticed the strange celestial bodies. They were bigger than stars, and showed up as disks about the size of ping-pong balls. They moved through the sky at a pace quick enough for the naked eye to detect the motion. But it was the first time two of them had appeared together. King Wen explained, When two flying stars appear, it means a stable era is about to begin. We've seen flying stars before. Yes, but only one at a time. Is two the most we'll see at once? No. Sometimes three will appear, but no more than that. If three flying stars appear, does that herald an even better era? King Wen gave one a frightened look. What are you talking about? Three flying stars. Pray that such a thing never happens. King Wen turned out to be right. The yearn for stable era soon began. Sunrise and sunset began to follow a pattern. A day-night cycle began to stabilize around 18 hours. The orderly alternation of day and night made the weather warm and mild. How long does a stable era last? Wang asked. As short as a day or as long as a century. No one can predict how long one will last. King Wen sat on the sand glass, lifting his head to gaze at the noonday sun. According to historical records, the Western Zhou dynasty experienced a stable era lasting two centuries. How lucky to be born during such a time. Then how long does a chaotic era last? I already told you. Other than stable eras, all other times belong to chaotic eras. Each of them takes up the time not occupied by the other. So, this is a world in which there are no patterns? Yes. Civilization can only develop in the mild climate of stable eras. Most of the time, humankind must collectively dehydrate and be stored. When a long stable era arrives, they collectively revive through rehydration. Then they proceed to build and produce. How can you predict the arrival and duration of each stable era? Such a thing has never been done. When a stable era arrives, the king makes a decision based on intuition as to whether to engage in mass rehydration. Often, the people are revived, crops are planted, cities begin construction, life has just started and then the stable era ends. 
extreme cold and heat then destroy everything. King Wen now pointed at Wang, his eyes sparkling. Now you know the goal of this game, to use our intellect and understanding to analyze all phenomena until we can know the pattern of the sun's movement. The survival of civilization depends on it. Based on my observations, there is no pattern to the sun's movement at all. That's because you do not understand the fundamental nature of the world. And you do? Yes. This is why I'm going to Zhao Ge. I will present King Zhou with an accurate calendar. But I've seen no evidence on this trip that you can do such a thing. Predicting the sun's motion is only possible in Zhao Ge, for that is where Yin and Yang meet. Only the lots cast there are accurate. The two continued on through the harsh conditions of another chaotic era, interrupted briefly by a short stable era, until they finally arrived in Zhao Ge. Wan heard an unceasing roar that sounded like thunder. The sound was generated by the numerous giant pendulums that could be seen all over Zhao Ge, each tens of meters in height. The weight of each pendulum was a giant rock, suspended from a thick rope tied to a bridge that stretched between the tops of two slender stone towers. All the pendulums were swinging as groups of soldiers and armor kept them in motion. Chanting incomprehensibly, they rhythmically pulled ropes attached to the giant stone weights, adding to the pendulum's arcs as they slowed. One noticed that all the pendulums swung in step. From far away, the sight was awe-inducing. It was as though numerous giant clocks had been erected over the earth, or colossal, abstract symbols had fallen from the sky. The giant pendulum surrounded an even more enormous pyramid, standing like a tall mountain in the dark night. This was King Zhou's palace. Wang followed King Wen into a low door at the base of the pyramid, before which a few soldiers patrolled in the darkness, noiseless as ghosts. The door led to a long, narrow, dark tunnel going deep into the pyramid, with a few torches along the way. As they walked, King Wen spoke to Wang. During a chaotic era, the entire country is dehydrated. But King Zhou remains awake a companion to the lifeless land. In order to survive during a chaotic era, one must live in thick-walled buildings like this one, as though one were living underground. It's the only way to avoid the extreme heat and cold. After a long time in the tunnel, they finally arrived at the great hall at the center of the pyramid. Actually, the hall was not that big and reminded Wang of a cave. The man sitting on a dais and draped with a particolored hide was undoubtedly King Zhou. But what drew Wang's attention was a man dressed all in black. The black robe blended with the thick shadows in the great hall, and the pale white face seemed to float in air. This is Fu Shi. King Zhou introduced the man in black to Wang and King Wen. He spoke as though Wang and King Wen had always been there, while the man in black was the newcomer. He thinks that the sun is a temperamental god. When the god is awake, his moods are unpredictable, and thus we have a chaotic era. But when he's asleep, his breathing evens out, and thus we have a stable era. Fu Shi suggested that I build those pendulums you see out there, and keep them in constant motion. He claims that the pendulums can have a hypnotic effect on the sun god and cause him to sink into a long slumber. But we can all see that so far, the sun god remains awake, though from time to time he seems to nap briefly. King Zhou waved his hands, and servants brought over a clay pot and set it down on the small stone table before Fu Shi. Later, Wan found out that it was a pot of seasoned broth. Fu Shi sighed, lifted the pot, and drank in great gulps, the sound of his swallows echoing like the beating of a giant heart in the darkness. After he was halfway done with the contents, he poured the rest over his body. Then he threw down the pot and walked toward a large bronze cauldron suspended over a fire in the corner of the great hall. He climbed onto the edge of the cauldron and jumped in, stirring up a cloud of vapor. Ji Chang, sit down, King Zhou said. We'll eat in just a little while, he pointed to the cauldron. Foolish witchcraft, King Wen said glancing contemptuously at the cauldron. What have you learned about the sun? King Zhou asked. Firelight flickered in his eyes. The sun is not a god. 
The sun is yang, and the night is yin. The world proceeds on the balance between yin and yang. Though we cannot control the process, we can predict it. King Wen took out his bronze sword and drew a yin yang symbol on the floor, dimly lit by the fire. Then, he carved the sixty-four hexagrams of the I Ching around the symbol, the whole composition resembling a calendar wheel. My king, this is the code of the universe. With it, I can present your dynasty with an accurate calendar. Ji Chang, I need to know when the next long stable era will come. I will forecast it for you right now, King Wen said. He sat down in the middle of the Yin Yang symbol. His legs curled under him. He raised his head to look up at the ceiling of the Great Hall, his gaze seeming to penetrate the thick stones of the pyramid until it reached the stars. The fingers of his two hands began a series of rapid, complex movements, like components of a calculating machine. In the silence, only the soup in the cauldron in the corner made any noise, boiling and bubbling as though the shaman being cooked within was dream-talking in his sleep. King Wen stood up in the middle of the Yin Yang symbol. With his face still lifted to the ceiling, he said, Next will be a chaotic era lasting forty-one days. Then comes a five-day stable era. Thereafter, there will be a twenty-three-day chaotic era followed by an eighteen-day stable era. Then we'll have an eight-day chaotic era. But when this chaotic era is over, my king, the long stable era you've been waiting for will begin. That stable era will last three years and nine months. The climate will be so mild that it will be a golden age. We have to verify your initial predictions first. King Zhou said, his face expressionless. Wang heard a loud rumbling from above. A stone slab in the ceiling of the great hall slid open, revealing a square opening. Wang shifted his position and saw that the opening led to another tunnel going up through the center of the pyramid. At the end of the tunnel he could see a few twinkling stars. Game time sped up. Every few seconds in real time, two soldiers flipped over the sand glass brought by King Wen, indicating the passing of eight hours in game time. The opening through the ceiling flickered with random lights, and once in a while a ray of sunlight from the chaotic era shot into the Great Hall. Sometimes the light was weak, like moonlight. Sometimes the light was very strong and the incandescent white square cast against the ground glowed so brightly that the torches in the great hall paled in comparison. Wang continued to count the flipping of the sand glass. By the time it had been flipped one hundred and twenty times or so, the appearance of the sunlight through the square opening became regular. The first of the predicted stable eras had arrived. After fifteen more flips of the sand glass, the flickering light through the opening became patternless again the start of another chaotic era. Another stable era followed, and another chaotic era. The starting times and durations of the various eras were not exactly as King Wen had predicted, but they were close. After the conclusion of yet another eight-day chaotic era, the long stable era he predicted began. Wang kept counting the flips of the sand glass. Twenty days passed, and the sunlight falling into the Great Hall maintained the precise rhythm. Game time slowed down to normal. King Zhou nodded at King Wen. I shall erect a monument for you, one even greater than this palace. King Wen bowed deeply. My king, awaken your dynasty and let it prosper. King Zhou stood up on the dais and opened his arms, as though he wanted to embrace the whole world. In a strange, otherworldly voice, he began to chant. Rehydrate. As soon as the order was given, Everyone in the great hall rushed to the door. Wang followed King Wen closely, and they exited the pyramid through the long tunnel they'd entered by. When they emerged, Wang saw the noonday sun bathing the land in warmth. In a passing breeze he seemed to smell the fragrances of spring. Together, King Wen and Wang walked to a nearby lake. The ice over the lake had melted, and sunlight danced between the gentle waves. A column of soldiers shouted, Rehydrate! Rehydrate! As they ran toward a large stone building, shaped like a granary, next to the lake. On the road to Zhao Ge, Wan had seen many buildings like it, and King Wen had told him that these buildings were called dehydratories, 
warehouses where the dehydrated bodies could be stored. The soldiers opened the heavy stone doors of the dehydratory and carried out rolls of dusty skins. Each soldier walked to the lake shore and tossed them into the water. As soon as the skins touched the water, they began to unfurl and stretch out. Soon, the lake was covered by a layer of man-shaped floating skins, each rapidly absorbing the water and expanding. Gradually, all the man-shaped skin cutouts became fleshy bodies that gradually began to display signs of life. One by one, they struggled up out of the waist-deep water and stood up. Looking around at the sunny world with wide-open eyes, they appeared to have just awoken from a dream. Rehydrate! One man cried out. Rehydrate! Rehydrate! Other voices joyously echoed his. Everyone climbed out of the lake and ran naked toward the dehydratory. They carried out more skins and tossed them into the water, and even more of the revived climbed out of the lake. The same scene repeated itself around every lake and pool. The entire world was coming back to life. Oh, heavens! My finger! One saw a man who had just been revived standing in the middle of the lake, holding up one hand and crying. The hand was missing its middle finger, and blood flowed from the wound into the water. Others, who had also just been revived, passed by him as they happily waded ashore, ignoring him. Count yourself lucky, one of them said to the man. Some lost a whole arm or leg. Others had their heads chewed through by rats. If we hadn't been rehydrated in time, maybe all of us would have been eaten by the chaotic era rats. How long have we been dehydrated? One of the revived asked. You can tell by looking at the thickness of the dust covering the palace. I just heard that the king is no longer the king from before. But I don't know if he's the old king's son or grandson. It took eight days to complete the work of rehydration. All of the stored dehydrated bodies had been revived, and the world was given a new life. During these eight days, Everyone enjoyed regular cycles of sunset and sunrise, each cycle precisely twenty hours long. Enjoying the spring-like climate, everyone gave heartfelt praise to the sun and the gods who guided the world. On the night of the eighth day, the bonfires scattered over the ground seemed even more numerous and denser than the stars in the sky. The ruins of cities and towns abandoned during the chaotic eras once again filled with noise and light. Like every mass rehydration in the past, the people were going to celebrate all night to welcome their new life after the next sunrise. But the sun did not rise again. Every kind of timepiece indicated that the time for sunrise had passed, but the horizon remained dark in every direction. Ten hours later, there was still no sign of the sun, not even the slightest hint of dawn. The endless night lasted through a whole day, then two days. Coldness now pressed toward the earth like a giant hand. Inside the pyramid, King Wen knelt before King Zhou, pleading, My king, please continue to have faith in me. This is but temporary. I have seen the yawn of the universe gathering, and the sun will rise soon. The stable era and spring will continue. Let's begin to heat the cauldron. King Zhou said and sighed. Oh, king! A minister stumbled through the cave-like entrance into the great hall. There. There are three flying stars in the sky. Those in the great hall were stunned. The air seemed frozen. Only King Zhou remained impassive. He turned to Wang, to whom he had never deigned to speak before. You still don't understand what the appearance of three flying stars means, do you? Ji Chang, why don't you tell him? It indicates the arrival of a long period of extreme cold, cold enough to turn stone into dust. King Wen sighed. Dehydrate. King Zhou again chanted in that strange, otherworldly voice. Outside, people had already begun the process. They turned themselves back into dehydrated bodies to survive the long night that was coming. The lucky ones had time to be stacked in the dehydratories but many were abandoned in the empty fields. King Wen stood up slowly and walked toward the cauldron over the roaring fire in the corner of the great hall. He climbed up the side and paused for a few seconds before jumping in. 
Perhaps he had seen the thoroughly cooked face of Fu Xi laughing at him from the soup. Keep the fire low, King Zhou ordered, his voice weak. Then he turned to the others. You may exit if you wish. The game is no longer fun after it gets to this point. A red sign showed up above the Great Hall's cave-like entrance. Players in the Great Hall streamed toward it, and Wang followed the crowd. Through the long tunnel, they finally emerged outside the pyramid. Heavy snow falling through the night air greeted them. The bone-chilling cold caused Wang to shiver, and a display in a corner of the sky indicated that game time had sped up again. The snow continued without pause for ten days. By now the snowflakes were large and heavy, like pieces of solidified darkness. Someone whispered next to Wang. The snow is now composed of frozen carbon dioxide dry ice. Wang turned around and saw that the speaker was follower. After another ten days, the snowflakes turned thin and translucent. By the weak light from a few torches within the entrance to the long tunnel, the snowflakes gave off a faint blue glow, like pieces of dancing mica. Those snowflakes are now composed of solidified oxygen and nitrogen. The atmosphere is disappearing through deposition, which means it's near absolute zero above. Snow gradually buried the pyramid. The lowest layers were composed of water snow, then dry ice, and finally, on top, snow made of oxygen and nitrogen. The night sky became especially clear, and the stars glowed like a field of silver bonfires. A line of text appeared against the starry background. The long night lasted 48 years. Civilization number 137 was destroyed by the extreme cold. This civilization had advanced to the Warring States period before succumbing. The seed of civilization remains. It will germinate and again progress through the unpredictable world of three body. We invite you to log on in the future. Before exiting the game, one noticed the three flying stars in the sky. Revolving closely around each other, they seemed to perform a strange dance against the abyss of space. 8. Yuenjie one took off the V-suit and panoramic viewing helmet. His shirt was soaked with sweat, as if he had just awoken from a nightmare. He left the research center, got into his car, and drove to the address given to him by Ding Yi, the house of Yang Dong's mother. Chaotic era, chaotic era, chaotic era. The thought turned and turned in Wang's head. Why would the path of the sun through the world of three body be devoid of regularity and pattern? Whether a planet's orbit is more circular or more elliptical, its motion around its sun must be periodic. Total irregularity in planetary motion is impossible. Wang grew angry with himself. He shook his head, trying to chase away these thoughts. It's only a game. But I lost. Chaotic era, chaotic era, chaotic era. Damn it. Stop. Why am I thinking about this? Why? Soon, Wang found the answer. He had not played any computer games for years, and the hardware for gaming had clearly advanced greatly in the interim. The virtual reality and multisensory feedback were all effects he had not experienced as a young student. But Wang also knew that the sense of realism in Three Body wasn't due to the interface technology. He remembered taking a class in information theory as a third year student in college. The professor had put up two pictures. One was the famous Song Dynasty painting along the river during the Qingming Festival, full of fine, rich details. The other was a photograph of the sky on a sunny day, the deep blue expanse broken only by a wisp of cloud that one couldn't even be sure was there. The professor asked the class which picture contained more information. The answer was that the photograph's information content its entropy exceeded the paintings by one or two orders of magnitude. Three body was the same. Its enormous information content was hidden deep. Wang could feel it, but he could not articulate it. He suddenly understood that the makers of three body took the exact opposite of the approach taken by designers of other games. Normally, game designers tried to display as much information as possible to increase the sense of realism. 
but Three Bodies designers work to compress the information content to disguise a more complex reality, just like that seemingly empty photograph of the sky. One let his mind wander back to the world of Three Body. Flying stars. The key must be in the flying stars. One flying star, two flying stars, three flying stars. What did they mean? As he had that thought, he found himself at his destination. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. At the foot of the apartment building, one saw a graying, thin woman, about sixty years old. She wore glasses and was struggling to go up the stairs with a basket of groceries. He guessed that this was the woman he had come to see. A quick greeting confirmed his guess. She was Yang Dong's mother, Yi Wenjia. After hearing the purpose of Wang Miao's visit, she was grateful and appreciative. Wang was familiar with old intellectuals like her. The long years had ground away all the hardness and fierceness in their personalities, until all that was left was a gentleness like that of water. Wang carried the grocery basket up the stairs for her. When they got to her apartment, it turned out to be not as quiet as he had expected. Three children were playing, the oldest about five, and the youngest barely walking. He told one that they were all the neighbor's kids. They like to play at my place. Today is Sunday, and their parents need to work overtime, so they left them to me. Oh, Nan Nan, have you finished your picture? Oh, it looks great. Shall we give it a title? Ducklings in the Sun? Sounds good. Let Granny write it for you. Then I'll put down the date, June 9th, by Nan Nan. And what do you want to eat for lunch? Yan Yang, you want fried eggplant? Sure. Nan Nan, you want the snow peas like you had yesterday? No problem. How about you, Mimi? You want some meat meat? Oh no, your mom told me that you shouldn't eat so much meat meat, not easy to digest. How about some fishy instead? Look at this big fishy granny bot. Wang observed ye and the children, absorbed in their conversation. She must want grandkids. But even if Yang Dong were alive, would she have had children? Ye took the groceries into the kitchen. When she reemerged, she said, Xiao Wang, I'm going to soak the vegetables for a while. She had slipped effortlessly into addressing him by an affectionate diminutive. These days, they use so much pesticide that when I feed the children, I have to soak the vegetables for at least two hours. Why don't you take a look in Dong Dong's room first? Her suggestion, tagged on at the end as though it was the most natural thing in the world, made Wang anxious. Clearly, she had figured out the real purpose of his visit. She turned around and went back into the kitchen without giving Wang another glance, and so avoided seeing his embarrassment. Wang was grateful that she was so considerate of his feelings. Wang walked past the three happily playing children and entered the room that Yi had indicated. He paused in front of the door, seized by a strange feeling. It was as if he had returned to his dream-filled youth. From the depths of his memory arose a tingling sadness, fragile and pure like morning dew, tinged with a rosy hue. Gently, he pushed the door open. The faint fragrance that filled the room was unexpected, the smell of the forest. He seemed to have entered the hut of a ranger. The walls were covered by strips of bark. The three stools were unadorned tree stumps. The desk was made from three bigger tree stumps pushed together. And then there was the bed, apparently lined with ewer sedge from northeast China, which the locals stuffed into their shoes to stay. Warm in the cold climate. Everything was rough-hewn and seemingly careless, without signs of aesthetic design. Yang Dong's job had earned her a high income, and she could have bought a home and some luxury development, but she chose to live here with her mother instead. Wang walked up to the tree stump desk. It was plainly furnished, and nothing on it betrayed a hint of femininity or scholarly interest. Maybe all such objects had been taken away, or maybe they had never been there. He noticed a black and white photograph in a wooden frame, a portrait of mother and daughter. In the picture, Yang Dong was just a little girl, and Yi Wenjia was crouching down so that they were the same height. A strong wind tangled the pair's long hair together. 
The background of the photograph was unusual. The sky seemed to be seen through a large net held up by thick steel supporting structures. One deduced that it was some kind of parabolic antenna, so large that its edges were beyond the frame of the photograph. In the picture, little Yang Dong's eyes gave off a fright that made Wang's heart ache. She seemed terrified by the world outside the picture. Next, Wang noticed a thick notebook at the corner of the desk. He was baffled by the material the notebook was made of until he saw a line of childish writing scrawled across the cover, Yang Dong's Birch Bark Notebook. Birch was written in pinyin letters instead of using the character for it. The years had turned the silvery bark into a dull yellow. He reached out to touch the notebook, hesitated, and retracted his hand. It's okay, he said from the door. Those are pictures Dong Dong drew when she was little. Wan picked up the birch bark notebook and gently flipped through it. He had dated each picture for her daughter, just like she had been doing for Nan Nan in the living room. Wan saw that, based on the dates on the pictures, Yang Dong was three when she drew them. Normally, children of that age are able to draw humans and objects with clear shapes, but Yang Dong's pictures remain only messes of random lines. They seemed to express a kind of passionate anger and desperation born out of a frustrated desire to express something not the sort of feeling one would expect in a child that young. Yi slowly sat down on the edge of the bed, her eyes staring at the notebook, lost in thought. Her daughter had died here, ended her life while. She slept. Wang sat next to her. He had never felt such a strong desire to share the burden of another's pain. Yi took the birch bark notebook from him and held it to her chest. In a low voice, she said, I wasn't good at teaching Dong Dong in an age-appropriate manner. I exposed her too early to some very abstract, very extreme topics. When she first expressed an interest in abstract theory, I told her that field wasn't easy for women. She said, What about Madame Curie? I told her, Madame Curie was never really accepted as part of that field. Her success was seen as a matter of persistence and hard work, but without her, someone else would have completed her work. As a matter of fact, Wu Qianxing went even further than Madame Curie. But it really isn't a woman's field. Dong Dong didn't argue with me, but I later discovered that she really was different. For example, let's say I explained a formula to her. Other children might say, what a clever formula. But she would say, this formula is so elegant, so beautiful. The expression on her face was the same as when she saw a pretty wildflower. Her father left behind some records. She listened to all of them and finally picked something by Bach as her favorite, listening to it over and over. That was the kind of music that shouldn't have mesmerized a kid. At first I thought she picked it on a whim, but when I asked her how she felt about the music, she said that she could see in the music a giant building, a large, complex house. Bit by bit, the giant added to the structure, and when the music was over, the house was done. You were a great teacher for your daughter, Wang said. No, I failed. Her world was too simple, and all she had were ethereal theories. When they collapsed, she had nothing to lean on to keep on living. Professor Yi, I can't say that I agree with you. Right now, events are happening that are beyond our imagination. It's an unprecedented challenge to our theories about the world, and she's not the only scientist to have stumbled down that path. But she was a woman. A woman should be like water, able to flow over and around anything. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. As Wang was about to leave, he remembered the other purpose for his visit. He mentioned to Yi his wish to observe the cosmic microwave background. Oh, that? There are two places in China that work on it. One is an observatory in Yurumki. I think it's a project by the Chinese Academy of Sciences Space Environment Observation Center. The other is very close by, a radio astronomy observatory located in the suburbs of Beijing which is run by the Chinese Academy of Sciences and Peking University's Joint Center for Astrophysics. The one in Yurumki does ground observation, 
and the one here just receives data from satellites, though the satellite data is more accurate and complete. I have a former student working there, and I can make a call for you. Yi found the phone number and dialed it. The ensuing conversation seemed to go smoothly. You're all set, Yi said as she hung up. Let me give you the address. You can go over any time. My student's name is Shah Ruishan, and he's going to be working the night shift tomorrow. I don't think this is your field of research, right? I work in nanotech. This is for something else. Wang was afraid that he was going to ask more questions about why he sought this information, but she did not. Sha Wang, you look a bit pale. How's your health? She asked, her face full of concern. It's nothing. Please don't worry. Wait a moment. Yi took a small wooden box out of a cabinet. Wan saw from the label that it was ginseng. An old friend from the base, a soldier, came to visit me a few days ago and brought this take it, take it. It's cultivated, not very precious. I have high blood pressure and can't use it anyway. You can slice it thinly and make it into a tea. You look so pale that I'm sure you can use the enrichment. You're still young, but you have to watch your health. Juan accepted the box, warmth filling his chest. His eyes moistened. It was as though his heart, stressed almost beyond the breaking point by the last few days, had been placed onto a pile of soft down feathers. Professor Yi, I will come visit you often.